This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 62. Coming up on Space Time. Discovery of a new type of pulsating star. A glitch in a neutron star. And a massive radiation leak from a huge blast at a top-secret Russian weapons test. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered a new type of pulsating subdwarf star. The findings, reported in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, suggest these are sun-like stars, with their superheated cores exposed, causing them to pulsate. Scientists can tell a lot about a star by the light it gives off. For example, its colour reveals its surface temperature and the elements in and around it. Its brightness correlates with its mass, and for many stars, brightness can fluctuate, a bit like a flickering candle. Many stars, including our own sun, pulsate, at least on a very small scale. But this newly discovered pulsator is varying in brightness every five minutes, and that's really strange. A true pulsator can vary in brightness by up to 10% due to periodic changes in its temperature, its radius, or both. Those with the largest, brightest changes are usually radial pulsators, breathing in and out as the entire star changes size. And by studying these pulsations in detail, astronomers can learn lots about these stars' inner properties. Initially, the authors were searching for binary stars, with periods of less than an hour in observations from the Zwicky Transient Facility, a sky survey at the Mount Palomar Observatory near San Diego. Now, to have periods of less than an hour means these binary stars are really close together, and sometimes, as in the case of spectroscopic binaries, as you look at the star, you can't actually tell that it's two stars. It's only by the way they orbit around each other that their light, their brightness, seems to change. And it's that change in brightness which can be determined by a spectroscope, which then lets you know that you're actually looking at two stars, not one. As the astronomers carried out their study, four stars stood out due to large changes in their brightness over just a few minutes. Follow-up data quickly confirmed that these were indeed pulsators and not binary pairs. The authors identify the standout stars as hot subdwarf pulsators. A subdwarf is a type of star with only about a tenth diameter of the Sun and with a mass somewhere between a fifth and about half that of the Sun. But they're incredibly hot, with surface temperatures of around 33,000 degrees Celsius. That compares to the Sun's surface temperature of 5,800 degrees. Scientists think these subdwarfs started their lives as typical sun-like stars, fusing hydrogen into helium in their cores, and they were on their way to becoming red giants. But then, something's gone wrong. After exhausting the hydrogen in their core, converting it all to helium, the stars usually leave the main sequence stage of their evolution and begin fusing the helium deep in their core into oxygen and carbon. At the same time, they expand into bloated red giants. That's because their core heats up, increasing radiant pressure, causing their outer gaseous envelopes to expand away from the core, hence they become physically bigger in size. And because their gaseous envelopes are now further away from the core, they cool down somewhat, hence they become more redder in colour. And it's from this we get the term red giant. However, scientists think that with these newly discovered stars, they were in close binary systems, but had their outer material stolen by a companion star before the helium became hot enough and dense enough to begin fusing. In the past, hot subdwarves were almost always related to stars which became red giants, started fusing helium in their cores, and then got stripped off by a companion. This study's lead author, Thomas Carfer from the University of California, Santa Barbara, says the new findings indicate that this group also includes different types of stars, some doing helium fusion and some not. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Astronomers are a step closer to solving one of the great mysteries of neutron stars, namely why they glitch. Neutron stars are created when very massive stars, far larger than the Sun, reach the end of their lives and explode in powerful events known as core collapse supernovae, blasts bright enough to briefly outshine an entire galaxy. What's left behind is a highly compacted super-dense stellar corpse in which the positively charged protons and negatively charged electrons are crushed together to form neutrons, hence the star's name. Although only a dozen or so kilometres wide, neutron stars are the densest objects in the known universe, other than black holes. 
Neutron stars rotate very rapidly, generating powerful energy beams which are thought to emanate from near the surface. If the rotational axis of the neutron star doesn't line up with its magnetic poles, the star's energy beam won't appear to be stationary, but will sweep, sort of like a flashing lighthouse across the cosmos. We call stars like this pulsars. The majority of pulsars spin at a rate of about one revolution per second, although some have been recorded at rotational rates of around 650 times per second. Anything spinning faster than around 50 milliseconds is generally referred to as a millisecond pulsar. Neutron stars rotate very quickly and very regularly. At least that is, until they suddenly don't. Occasionally, a neutron star will suddenly start to spin faster. We think that's caused by portions inside the star moving outwards. Astronomers refer to these as a glitch, and it provides them with a brief insight into what really lies inside these mysterious objects. Now, a report in the journal Nature Astronomy has detailed a study of a well-known neutron star called the Vela Pulsar, which has undergone one of these glitches. The Vela Pulsar is a rapidly spinning neutron star located in the Vela supernova remnant about a thousand light years away in the southern constellation of Vela, the sails of the ship Argo, which in ancient Greek mythology was sailed by Jason and the Argonauts in their quest to find the Golden Fleece. The study's lead author, Dr. Greg Ashton from Monash University, says Vela is famous not only because only about 5% of pulsars are known to glitch, but also because Vela glitches about once every three years, making it a favourite amongst glitch hunters. By reanalyzing the data from observations of the Vela glitch in 2016, Ashton and colleagues found that during the glitch, the star actually started spinning even faster before eventually relaxing down to a final state. This observation, carried out at the Mount Pleasant Observatory in Tasmania, was especially important because it gave astronomers their first glimpse into the interior of the star, revealing it probably has three different components. One is a soup of superfluid neutrons located in the inner layer of the crust. It moves outwards first and hits the rigid outer crust of the star, causing it to spin up. But then there's a second soup of superfluid material which moves in the core, which catches up to the first, causing the spin of the star to slow back down again. Now this overshoot had been predicted, but this is the first real time it's been identified in observations. But the mystery doesn't end there. There's another observation which Ashton and his team made, and that's still defying explanation. Immediately before the glitch, the authors noticed that the star seemed to slow down in its rotation rate before spinning up again. It's the first time this has been observed, and astronomers have no idea what it was or why it happened. To find out more, Andrew Dugley is speaking with astronomer Dr. Fred Watson. Now, Fred, to the fascinating topic of neutron stars. Now, it seems rather accidentally, uh, some Australian scientists have um, figured out what they're made of, because they have these strange habits, don't they? They do. So neutron stars were first observed as what are called pulsars. And pulsars are, they were thought at first to be little green men. They were discovered by Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell, who we had the pleasure of hosting here in Australia last year. But what pulsars are, are basically very highly repetitive bursts of radio radiation, sometimes only a millisecond long, but repeating on that sort of time scale. Neutron stars are known to be the result of these crazy, highly compressed stars, which beam out radiation from their magnetic poles, and they rotate very, very rapidly. And so the radiation acts almost like a lighthouse beam. It sweeps out through space. And when the Earth is in the right position relative to one of these things, we get these succession of blips of radio radiation. The great thing about them is that they are incredibly regular, but it has been known for it's many all the years. the fibre they eat, Fred. That's... <laughs> <laughs> you didn't think I could stoop uh, any lower, but... <laughs> well... Well, just keep eating your prunes. You'll be all right. Um, <laughs> yes, they're very regular. These bursts of radiation are actually more accurate than atomic clocks wow. in terms of how regular they keep the time. Except that once in a while, they experience something that is technically known, and this is true, it's technically known as a glitch. They speed up slightly and then slow down slightly and then speed up back to the original speed that they were going at. It goes slightly faster very briefly, slightly slower, very briefly, and then back to normal. Where and we're talking just... like periods of seconds? Yes, I think so. I am not a pulsar specialist, but I think the 
relatively short periods of time when these glitches occur, which is kind of why they're called glitches. Yeah, the particular one that's been observed that we're talking about today, the whole thing lasted 13 seconds. Wow. So they, yeah. they, you, know, you, you are talking about events that if you blink, you'll miss them. So what causes the, the pulsar phenomenon? It, it, it's, as you said, it's neutron stars. And neutron stars are basically the most dense and gravitationally intense thing next to a black hole because they're the result of a star collapsing on itself so that the only thing that is withstanding the huge gravitational pull of a star's worth of material, the only thing that's stopping it collapsing to a black hole is the pressure of neutrons, that all the neutrons are jostling together and they can just overcome the, the self-gravity of this thing, which wants to pull itself into a black hole. So that's the situation with neutron stars. A mass of a whole whole star like the sun, in fact, usually more massive than the sun, compressed into something 10 kilometres or so across. It just beggars belief, the, yeah. the density of, of the It would the be material. like your car running out of petrol and then collapsing in on itself to the size of a pea. That sort of thing, yes, yeah. except I think it might be more like the size of an atom. Yeah, it may be, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because it's such a, a different state of matter that we're talking about. Now, theoreticians, theoretically, astrophysicists, they study what might be inside neutron stars and the structure that seems to fit the physics and seems to fit what we observe is an internal fluid of neutrons that, that in the middle, it's a, almost like a liquid, but it's neutrons, as I said, pressing, you know, pressing up against each other. So the laws of physics that these neutrons obey are quite different from what a liquid would obey. But a liquid, a, a, you know, it's a a good enough term to use to get over the idea that it's not just a solid mass of neutrons, that they can move around relative to each other. But on the outside of it, there's a crust, a sort of hard crust. And that is where the intense magnetic fields play out that actually cause the material to beam out and give you the, the effect of the, the pulsar. That's the theoretical structure of your average neutron star. But the idea of the glitches, what makes them, is something that has puzzled astrophysicists for many years. Well, I suppose when you've only got like 13 seconds to see this, it would be very, very hard to detect. Yeah, exactly. So the observers of pulsars over the years have spotted these glitches. We know that they happen. But, you know, finding one and predicting it, well, that's a bit different. Mm. So what's happened is a team, which includes astronomers from Monash University, which is down in Melbourne, in Victoria, and from the University of Tasmania, which is uh, even further south than Victoria, they used a radio telescope, which is actually in Tasmania. It's at a place called Mount Pleasant, which is very pleasant indeed, just outside the city of Hobart. It's quite a big one. It's a 26 metre diameter radio telescope. So it's not a little thing. It's got a reasonable amount of sensitivity. And they watched one of the brightest pulsars in the sky, which actually our observatory, the, Anglo the former Anglo-Australian observatory, had quite a lot to do with it. It's in the constellation of Vela. Vela, if I remember rightly, is the sail of the ship Argo. It's in a southern constellation. And Vela, we know, has the remains of a supernova in it, an exploding star, which generated at the end of its life a cloud of gas, which we can see and detect, we can see it in visible light and detect it with radio radiations, as well as this neutron star beaming out its radiation at the centre. Mm. It's called the Vela Pulsar. And the reason why we had a lot to do with it at the Anglo-Australian Telescope in Coonabarabran, this is back in the 70s, possibly, or certainly the 80s. I think it might be the 70s. Was because the Anglo Australian telescope was the first telescope to observe this pulsar in visible light. We could see it flashing. And that, I think, was only the second optical pulsar ever observed. So the astronomers were very patient with this telescope, and eventually they observed a glitch and observed it in enough detail that they could build a model of what's happening. And that model has now been published. The idea is the neutrons are just sort of squashed together, so they do behave like a, a liquid. But their quantum effects... And that turns them into something known as a superfluid, which doesn't behave like normal fluids do. Lots of funny little, you know, whirlpools, eddies, vortices, that kind of thing. And the suggestion is that you've got different layers of this superfluid within the rotating neutron star. And sometimes the stuff in the middle actually gets flung outwards to hit the hard crust of the star, and that makes it spin up faster. And then there's a sort of catch-up 
which slows it back down again. And eventually it returns to its normal speed. Sounds it's, simple, really, when you think about it. Yeah, <laughs> All this mystery and it's just, you know, a thing. It's a thing. But, of course, when you're doing these things, you don't just pull ideas out of the woodwork. No. You, you're looking at what the mathematics of quantum physics predict might happen to, to a huge mass of stuff like this. Anyway, it's excited pulsar and neutron star astronomers. And I think what everybody wants to do is wait for the next one so that there might be another glitch that maybe would confirm the theory that has been built around this. That's Professor Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science, speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. New readings are showing gamma radiation levels 16 times higher than normal background in towns and villages up to 30 kilometres from a Russian missile test site, which was rocked by a massive explosion last week. The explosion at the Noyanuska test site in the Russian Arctic killed at least five and as many as eight scientists who were providing engineering and technical support for an isotope power source for a new top-secret nuclear-powered missile. Reports indicate many other workers at the facility were hospitalised. Radiation sensors registered levels as high as 1.78 millisieverts per hour. Local civilian authorities initially issued warnings about the radiation problem, but they later retracted their warnings, claiming radiation levels were not above normal after all. Still, the blast and the warning that followed prompted many residents to buy iodine tablets, which can be used to help prevent the thyroid gland from absorbing radiation. The blast has been linked to a test of Moscow's new 9M730 petrol nuclear-powered nuclear-equipped cruise missile, touted by Russian President Vladimir Putin earlier this year. NATO codename SSCX9 Skyfall. US National Security Advisor John Bolton says both Russia's new hypersonic glide vehicle and its hypersonic nuclear-powered cruise missile systems are largely based on stolen American technology. In fact, as we reported several weeks ago, NASA has been working on a nuclear thermal propulsion system for deep space missions. Bolton says that while the test demonstrated that something has obviously gone very wrong, it also showed Russia was still spending enough on defense to not only modernize their nuclear arsenal, but also build new kinds of delivery vehicles, such as hypersonic glide vehicles and hypersonic cruise missiles, using what he calls ripped-off American designs. For its part, Russia's Western propaganda service Sputnik insists the vehicles were locally developed. The collapse of the Cold War-era Intermediate-Range Nuclear Forces Treaty has increased fears of a new arms race between the United States and Russia. Developing a nuclear-powered missile would, in theory, provide a weapon with unlimited range. But the technical barriers of such a weapon are huge, requiring the miniaturization of a nuclear reactor to a scale where it could be put inside a missile. A companion project being developed alongside Skyfall is the Poseidon Status 6 nuclear-powered torpedo, also apparently built around a miniature nuclear propulsion unit. Beijing has launched three new Yaogang-30 spy satellites for the Chinese military. The spacecraft were launched from the Zhaichang Satellite Launch Center in southern China's Sichuan province aboard a Long March 2C rocket. Beijing likes to describe these probes as experimental scientific satellites. In reality, they're remote-sensing reconnaissance spacecraft, equipped with sophisticated optical or synthetic aperture radar sensors. They form part of the People's Liberation Army's massive constellation of spy satellites, and are usually placed into orbits ranging from 602 to 1,110 kilometers in altitude. China's rapidly expanding private sector aerospace industry has successfully launched its first commercial rocket. Beijing Interstellar Glory Space Technology Limited, which goes by the brand name iSpace, flew its Hyperbola 1 rocket from the Zhukuang Satellite Launch Center in China's western Gobi Desert. The launch vehicle carried four payloads, including a telecommunications satellite for Chinese central television and three small payload packages which remained attached to the rocket's upper stage. The 21-metre-tall Hyperbola 1 is a three-stage rocket, the first two using solid fuel, while the third stage uses liquid propellant. Two other private Chinese companies have also attempted missions over the past two years, both failing to reach orbit. Hyperbola 1 is designed as a technology testbed for what will be a much larger liquid-fueled rocket, the Hyperbola 2. Hyperbola 2 will employ reusable liquid methane and oxygen-burning JD-1 methylox engines and will be capable of carrying payloads of up to two tons into low Earth orbit. Meanwhile, a new privately developed Japanese-sounding rocket has failed in its latest launch attempt. The Interstellar Technologies Momo F-4 was launched from the Taiki spaceport in Hokkaido. 
However, the 10 metre tall rocket suffered an onboard computer systems failure shortly after liftoff, triggering a premature engine shutdown. The launch had been delayed by a week due to technical problems. Interstellar Technology successfully launched Japan's first private rocket, dubbed Momo 3, back in May. That followed two earlier launch failures, one in July 2017, the other in June 2018. A new issue of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine set the new stands. And this month's issue looks at our nearest celestial neighbour, Luna, better known to most of us as the Moon. Joining us now with the details is the magazine's editor, Jonathan Nally. The Moon's been in the, the news quite a lot, probably more than it has been for a very long time with the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, of course. So in the August issue of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, we have a full beginner's guide to the Moon for both visual observers, people who just want to look at it, and also for people who like to take photographs. So we show you how to identify all the main craters, all the lunar mountain ranges and valleys, and we give you all the best tips and hints on what sort of camera you need to take shots. You can even just use your smartphone, in fact, if you hold it up to a telescope, or you can get a special bracket to put on your telescope and put the smartphone in like that. And some smartphones are you know, really good these days with their cameras, so um, you can get pretty good shots. Plus, we also show you how to use some uh, free software. There's plenty of it out there to bring out the best in all your lunar photos once you've taken them. I guess one question everyone always asks, is can you see the lunar landing sites? Uh, you and I cannot see the lunar landing sites. No, you can't see them from Earth. They're just too far away, too small. But the um, American spacecraft, the Lunar, the lunar Reconnaissance, Reconnaissance Orbiter, Orbiter, yeah, which has been going around the moon for quite a while now, that it's taken really good detailed shots showing the lunar landing sites. You can even see the tracks of where the astronauts were walking, where they disturbed the lunar soil. It's still you can still see it because <laughs> nothing much changes on the surface of the moon. There's barely barely any erosion whatsoever. So yeah, so. And the old thing of, you know, looking the other direction, it used to be said, you know, you can see the, um, the Great Wall of China from the moon. Well, you can't do that either. But I'll tell you what you can do, Stuart. You can see my house from space. I've, I've looked at it on Google Earth. Well, there you go. Um, I was going to say that, uh, that you, even though you can't see the, um, the Great Wall of China from the moon, you can see the moon from the Great Wall of China. That's Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. A new study warns that fracking is causing a significant increase of the greenhouse gas methane into the atmosphere. Methane is a far more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. A report in the journal Biogeosciences found the chemical fingerprint of methane in the atmosphere, which is unique to the type of methane released through fracking. They found this sharply spike between 2008 and 2014 in line with increased use of fracking in the mining process. Fracking uses high-pressure water to fracture shale deposits deep underground in order to access natural gas. Health experts are calling on agriculture and food producers to cut their antibiotic use on farm animals. A report in the Medical Journal of Australia warns large volumes of antibiotics are now being used in food-producing animals and reducing this amount is critical to addressing antibiotic resistance in humans. The antibiotics for the most part aren't being used to improve animal health, but simply as a fattening agent. The researchers found that an average of 182 tonnes of antibiotics that are important for human health were sold for use each year in animals between 2005 and 2010. During the same period, only 121 tonnes per year were used for humans. The Medical Journal of Australia says we should reduce the use of antibiotics in animals for purposes other than infections and instead develop preventative strategies such as vaccination and improve the design of production facilities. Well, if you're listening to Space Time, chances are you already know to avoid suspicious emails in order to keep hackers from gleaning personal information from your computer. But a new study from Southern Methodist University suggests it's possible to access your information in a much subtler way by using a nearby smartphone to intercept the sound of your typing. Researchers found that acoustic signals or sound waves produced by typing on a computer keyboard can successfully be picked up by a smartphone. Those sounds can then be processed, thereby allowing a skilled hacker to decipher which keys were struck and what they were typing with a better than 41% word accuracy rate. The researchers were able to decode much of what's being typed using common keyboards and smartphones, even in a noisy conference room full of the sounds of other people typing and having conversations. Geologists have uncovered a previously undescribed Jurassic world of around 100 ancient volcanoes buried deep within the Cooper-Eramanja basins of central Australia. 
The Cooper Aramancha Basins in the northeastern corner of South Australia and the southwestern corner of Queensland represent Australia's largest known onshore oil and gas producing region. But despite 60 years of petroleum exploration and production, this ancient Jurassic volcanic underground landscape has gone largely unnoticed until now. A report in the journal Gondwanda Research used advanced subsurface imaging techniques analogous to medical CT scanning to identify a plethora of volcanic craters and lava flows and the deeper magma chambers that fed them. The volcanoes developed during the Jurassic period between 180 and 160 million years ago, and they've been subsequently buried beneath hundreds of metres of sedimentary or layered rocks. While the majority of Earth's volcanic activity occurs at the boundaries of tectonic plates or under the Earth's oceans along deep ocean rifts, this ancient Jurassic world developed deep within Australia's continental plate. A new Pew Research Centre study shows the general public's trust in science has increased over the last few years. The study of almost 4,500 people across the United States found that between 86 and 87 percent of people had confidence that the work scientists were doing was in the public good. That's an increase of 10 percentage points over 2016 levels. It's also better than public support for the military on 82 percent, an increase of 3 percentage points, and better than public school principals on 77 percent, an increase of 12 percentage points. By comparison, religious leaders only have about a 57% approval rating, the news media 47%, business leaders 46%, and politicians on 35%. Yes, that's right, 35% of people out there actually trust politicians, and their vote's worth every bit as much as yours. The survey also found that people with greater scientific knowledge also have greater confidence in scientists than those with less knowledge. When it comes to science, it seems Americans are very much divided along party lines. I think the same thing's probably true in Australia. 82% of Republicans are trusting in scientists. That compares to 91% of Democrats. 73% of Democrats believe scientists should take an active role in scientific policy debates. While by contrast, 56% of Republicans say scientists should focus on establishing sound scientific facts and stay out of scientific policy debates. 62% of Democrats believe scientific judgments are based solely on facts, while 55% of Republicans say scientists are every bit as likely to be biased as anyone else. Interestingly, only 20% of Americans believe scientists are really transparent about any potential conflicts of interest they have. A new study of historical climate data going back over 2,000 years has shown the period of climatic change the Earth is currently experiencing is unprecedented. The findings, reported in the journal Nature and Nature Geoscience, show there's been no other period in recorded history where temperature changes have been as fast or extensive as in recent decades. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics says the three studies use reconstructions based on 700 records of temperature change, such as trees, ice and sediment, from all continents, showing that minor climatic anomalies such as the Little Ice Age were regional rather than global events. There's been a bit. A number of things which have always been claimed by those people who uh, reject the concept of climate change and they are suggesting that in the past the climate has been fluctuating quite a lot and they claim recent things, well fairly recent things, like the, the little ice ages which were going on at various times, various places over probably about a 500 year period up until about the mid 1800s depending on where you were. Also the medieval climate anomaly or medieval warm period is actually what it's often called. That was about 900s to about 1200s CE and that was sort of like a Obviously, a warmer period, so these things they said indicate that the climate's always been going up and down. The trouble is, these things have been local. They've been in particular areas, whether it's sort of parts of Europe or parts of North America or even parts of the Pacific. They haven't been global effects. And what this recent study was looking at a whole wide range of indicators that there has been this climate sort of change over the last 2,000 years. And what we're seeing now in recent times is far more dramatic and it's far wider spread. So it's global rather than local. And so a lot of these things which have been sort of claimed by climate change deniers that these uh, these climate change happening all the time, it's been cherry picking. It's basically been looking at things which are localised. It might be continental size localised, but they're not sort of global effects. And therefore, what we're seeing now is something totally different. Are climate change deniers who are in the public eye, and we're talking about journalists and public commentators, things like that, and those advocating that cause for political reasons, are they becoming more blatant? There was one I saw recently uh, by a 
well-known journalist who was talking about the big die-off of uh, reindeer. These theories about an island which is off Norway, a large island but between Norway and Greenland, uh, had a, a large number of reindeer dying off. And uh, the story goes, the scientists found that during the, the winter, the warm air was sort of uh, allowing less ice to form, more rain to fall, and where it fell in winter, it was forming ice and blocking out the reindeer's food supplies, whereas in summer, the same warm air was actually making everything grow really well and leading to an overpopulation of reindeer, which then impacted when they have a shortage of food in winter. He thought these were two different things. He thought, he suggested, well, how can it be good in one place and bad in another? Well, that's climate for you. (laughs) climate has different effects at different times and in this particular case because it is warmer it's the same warming but in summertime it actually leads to an overpopulation but in winter that backfires badly by the same warming which actually creates a shortage of accessibility to food he then goes on and follows on with a total non-secretary of talking about other reindeer populations in Siberia about two and a half thousand kilometers away it's that sort of stuff which is a lack of logic but then I do a bit of research to investigate these things and a lot of them are just easily debunked just by doing some research and it doesn't take that long for some of them to actually say that's not true. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom from spacetimewithstuartgary.com or from your favourite podcast download provider. Space Times also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 